of the third foundation day of regional institute of ophthalmology bhu the theme of this year's webinar is cornea and refractive surgery our esteemed i'll just share the screen our the theme of today's webinar is cornea and refractive surgery our esteemed institution the banaras hindu university was founded by bharat ratna pandit madan mohan malvi ji at the outset we offer floral tributes to our founder as is the largest residential university in asia which is spread over 4000 acres we have six institutes 14 faculties and 140 departments our total enrollment annually crosses 35000 students coming from over 48 countries this was established in 1916 now our regional institute of ophthalmology initially our department of ophthalmology was established in 1964 it was then inaugurated by the then prime minister le shri lal bahadur shastri ji and it was upgraded to the regional institute of ophthalmology only 3 years back by our honorable prime minister shri narendra modi ji on this day that is 17 september 2018 uh, the chief guest of our webinar is honorable vice chancellor professor v k shukla sir uh, he is the former director of institute of medical sciences he has been the medical superintendent of the sir sundar lal hospital and he was also the head of the department of surgery of the institute of medical sciences sir we welcome you he has been a fellow of the college of world care specialist malaysia and national medical academy he has more than 500 publications four books and many chapters to his credit this is our chief of the rio professor mk singh welcome sir coming to our speakers our speaker dr harminder singh jua dua is the chair and professor of ophthalmology at the university of nottingham uk and he has been appointed the commander of the order of british empire in 2019 birthday honors for services to eye health care health education and ophthalmology in march 2021 appointed to the ceremonial post of sheriff of nottingham for 2021 and 22 we welcome you sir our speaker second speaker is professor dr j s titial he is the chief and head of dr rp center aims new delhi he has been awarded with padma shri for his outstanding contribution in the field of medicine achievement award for aao american academy of ophthalmology more than 30 orations he has numerous articles more than 400 articles four textbooks 52 chapters and he is our guardian thank you so much sir for giving your precious time now i request uh, dr m k singh our chief to kindly welcome the guests thank you dr prashant am i audible yes sir very much thank you the chief guest of today's function professor v k sukla honorable vice chancellor of banaras hindu university our guest speakers professor h s dua renowned cornea surgeon from uk jsttl chief rp center aims new delhi and well known refractive surgeon my colleagues respected participants ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all in this program organized on the third foundation day of the regional institute of ophthalmology i welcome professor v k sukla the honorable vice chancellor banaras hindu university and farmer director institute of medical sciences who has been instrumental in the creation of this regional institute of ophthalmology he takes keen interest in day to day functioning and progress of the center and helps us by all means available at his disposal i welcome professor h s dua a renowned cardiac surgeon happily accepted our offer and agreed to deliver his talk and it delighted me for js titial is like our family member whenever we invite him 
whether for examination, for workshop or speech, he gives consent with a pleasant smile. I welcome you, sir, and hope that in future too, you will continue to shower your love and affection on us. I welcome all my colleagues in the department who are striving hard to fulfill the goals and objectives of RIO. I welcome all respected ophthalmic fraternity who have joined us in this webinar to make it a great success. And I hope that they will be immensely benefited by the deliberations of this webinar. Thank you. And I welcome you all again in this function. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request Professor V.K. Shukla, sir, our chief guest, he is also the Vice Chancellor of our university, sir, to kindly uh, give your blessings to us. Thank you, Professor Prashant. Esteemed speakers, Professor H.S. Dua and Professor J.S. Fithyal, Professor M.K. Singh, Chief of RIO, all the dignitaries and participants virtually present here, I extend my warm greetings and welcome to you all. I'm happy to learn that the RIO is celebrating its third foundation day. On this occasion, I congratulate the members of the Department of Ophthalmology and the RIO. Three years ago, the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Modi ji laid the foundation stone of this institute and on 15th July this year, he inaugurated it. This upgradation of Department of Ophthalmology into the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology is an excellent gift to the people of this region. You all will agree with me that blindness continues to be one of the major public health problems in India. According to the WHO, corneal diseases are among the major causes of vision loss and blindness in the world today after cataract and glaucoma. With the view to provide medical care for eye diseases par excellence in a holistic manner, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare envisaged to provide assistance for setting up of RIO in this part of the country. The Regional Institute of Ophthalmology is a center of excellence and it will play an important role in strengthening of eye care services delivery by bringing its in latest technology in the field and translating the innovations to high quality eye care. This institute will also contribute by developing the human resources for eye care by providing training to the manpower like ophthalmologist, ophthalmic assistants, refractionists, and other paramedical personnel. Summarily, we can stay, we can say that this institute will provide state-of-the-art services in all spheres related to patient care, training, and research. This institute has been established with the objective to evolve and demonstrate methods of rendering a highly competent ophthalmic service to the community through an integrated approach of promotive, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative concept. In addition to this, it aims to provide facilities for training of ophthalmologists, subspecialties, ancillary ophthalmic personnel like ophthalmic assistants and nurses. The stimulation of research in ophthalmology at its highest level in all areas of ophthalmology, encompassing clinical sciences, epidemiology, surveys, basic sciences, laboratory, and allied sciences is another objective of this institute. A library has also been built for research and studies for the treatment of eye diseases. I'd like to mention here that the Department of Ophthalmology was inaugurated 57 years earlier by the then Prime Minister Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji. Since then till today, it has stood on the full faith and belief of about 200 million people of Eastern Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand and Nepal. At present, about 500 patients visit IOPD every day for treatment. The establishment of the RIO will strengthen the department's commitment towards providing medical care for eye diseases in this region. With these words, I would like to congratulate the organizers and extend my best wishes to all the panelists and participants. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Now I request uh, our esteemed speaker, and Dr. Harminder Singh Dua, sir, to kindly say a few words. Instead of few words, I think he should start with his presentation. Thank you very much. Good 
let's get this to go. Uh, so um, once again, I would uh, like to uh, give my thanks uh, to uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Shukla, MK Singh, Prashant Vassal, Deepak Mishra, uh, and of course, my regards, my very fond, uh, respectful regards to Professor Titeal uh, for being making me part of this celebration. I congratulate all of you on your third Foundation Day celebration and for becoming a regional institute of ophthalmology. I always begin with this quote, which I wrote for myself uh, some time back, because the number of times I have given this talk and other talks, uh, it becomes embarrassing to repeat the same thing over and again. So I apologize to those of you who have heard most of this. Uh, those who have heard some of this will see a lot new, but I'm sure even those who have heard most of this will have something new because science keeps progressing in small steps. This is how it all started many years ago. We know uh, I have seen patients with these square graphs. This is pictures from uh, Peter Labson. Um, I used to tell my son, who used to watch me preparing the lecture, that this is what happens if you see too much television. Uh, we all know that despite over 100 years of cornea transplantation, some problems remain like rejection or non-rejection failure. Uh, if you have stem cell deficiency, the graft is bound to fail. This graft host junction is forever weak. You will find that there is always a risk of dehiscence. Even many, many years ago, suture-related problems are always there. And even when you get a very clear, nice graft, as you see in the middle picture, you can have a lot of astigmatism and vision can be very poor. So no cornea can survive this little test shown over here uh, related to the problems that are age old problems uh, of cornea transplantation. The answer came not so much from progress in biology, but from progress in surgery. For example, now for conditions that affect the stroma and the anterior part of the cornea, Deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty is there, and uh, it does away with the problem of endothelial rejection, although the problems of astigmatism, suture-related issues continue to remain. Uh, where there are problems of the endothelium, and we know there are a lot of those uh, with dystrophies of first surgery, then endothelial keratoplasty has come, and this does away with the problems of a weak graft post junction, suture related problems, rapid visual acuity, away with the problem of astigmatism, but the risk of rejection remains. So not all the problems have been completely solved, but many of them have been addressed by surgery. Now, my story actually begins with this operation. Many of you have probably done it yourselves. Many of you would have heard about this uh, operation and just a very quick 30 second video to show you what actually happens. So you make a trephination deep in the stroma, you put a needle in, inject air, and the air is supposed to separate the Desmet's membrane from the rest of the cornea. You take the top half or two thirds away, you puncture this bubble, and then you cut it into quadrants and excise the quadrants. So this was called the Anwar's, Muhammad Anwar established this technique and it was called the Anwar's Big Bubble Technique and also labeled in many textbooks and many journals as a Desmet's bearing technique. Now, I started doing this operation many years ago, but certain things did not add up. And this is where the interesting bit starts, where we were bearing the Desmet's membrane, but this Desmet's membrane was more resilient. It could bounce an instrument off the Desmet's membrane. It was different to what we had come to learn of or experience uh, uh, the feel of a Desmet's membrane. Then secondly, when we do a cornea transplantation, uh, what happens is that you, you are, if you're suturing a full thickness cornea graft and you're putting your needle through the tissue, you see this edge stand up. And we were always told that this edge is the Desmet's membrane. And you can see it, and you, in the adults, you should not go through and through it. Now, the other thing we learned 
by this dark wall, it's very easy to strip away the desmitch membrane from the donor from the rest of the donor stroma, which we are going to transplant. We have to we throw away the desmitch membrane of the donor because that is not needed. We're going to retain the, the, the host desmitch membrane and uh, reduce the antigen load. Now, keep this in mind. Let's go back a step. So here you can see a dark is being done and I can still see that edge. Now I have taken the desmitch membrane away as I just showed you, but why am I still seeing that edge? So that is not produced by the desmitch membrane only. So that was another thing which was not adding up to what was being taught and written. Then if you go further ahead, in, in many cases where the big bubble does not reach the edge of the trifine mark, when you're separating the stroma from the desmitch membrane, you see these strands. And sometimes they're so strong that these strands have to be cut. So the question was that if it is so easy to separate the desmids from the stroma, why do we strands when, see strands when we're separating the stroma from the desmids? So clearly, we are talking of different planes. We are not talking of the same thing, although that is what we have been teaching and writing in the books. So we hypothesize that there exists a distinct layer in the posterior stroma that is different from the desmids membrane. And it is this plane of cleavage where the separation occurs in big bubble dal. And to prove this, we simulated dal in eye bank donor eyes. And we then published up or presented our pilot data in two different international meetings in the same year. This is going back to 2007. The one was in the Royal College of Ophthalmologists and one was in the Italian Ocular Surface Society. And we called it the pre desmid stromal layer then. And this then is the outcome of the ex vivo or in vitro experiment. So notice the air going in this circular manner. Notice the air that escapes at the periphery. A central bubble forms, which then moves towards the periphery, but does not go all the way up. And this was very consistent, and we call this the type 1 big bubble. Now, notice over here, you'll see the same thing. This circumferential inject air, circumferential movement along the periphery, but a thinner wall bubble starts at the periphery and grows across the entire surface of the cornea. Notice again that circular movement of air and then a thin wall bubble starting at the periphery, another one starting at the periphery. So most of the time it starts at the periphery and you can also see this uh, uh, escape of air from the, the periphery of the cornea. Uh, so this was a different bubble to the other one. So we call this the type two bubble because very different is went across the entire surface of the cornea. And in some cases, you have both together. And this is what we call the mixed bubbles. There's a central type one bubble and this large area of the type two bubble. Here you can see the central type one bubble and this little crescent of a type two bubble. Now, nowadays, some people also call it the type three bubble, but it is not a single bubble. It's two bubbles coming together. So even if you're going to call it type three, you have to call it type three bubbles rather than a bubble or mixed bubble is simpler. Now. We took this further, and this is what I call my Eureka moment. We created a type 1 bubble, and we could strip off the entire desmids membrane without deflating the bubble. You can see the bubble is still intact, and you see the surface left behind, slightly rough looking surface, but there is this. So clearly, when you get a type 1 bubble, if you take away the desmids, you can still see there is a layer underneath, and that was the layer we had hypothesized that existed. Now, some people said, oh, there is a split in the banded and non-banded zones of the desmids membrane when you get a mixed bubble. Uh, we found that whether you get a mixed or a type 1 or a type 2, if you strip off the desmids membrane, you always see a full thickness desmids membrane, the endothelium. This is the banded layer and the non-banded layer of the desmids membrane. Now, this is also quite interesting. So when you have a type 2 bubble and you try to peel that off, it immediately deflates. The whole bubble goes. So very different from a type 1 where the bubble stays. So here, a different phenomenon is occurring. The air is between desmids membrane and the layer anterior to it. It is, it is not similar to the type 1, clearly. But the important thing was you can 
take the desmets off and go in and inject and create another type 1 bump. I, this, in this instance, there will be no desmets membrane, but the pre desmets layer, the stromal layer, is there, and it can, in the absence of the desmets membrane, also come up in the form of a bubble. And that was again proof that of its existence and that the bubble does not require the desmets membrane to form. Now, the question was why doesn't it go all the way to the periphery? And how much pressure can we push in it to push it all the way to the periphery if at all? So we keep increasing the pressure at about a pressure of about 700 millimeters of mercury, it bursts. And it never goes to the full periphery, about eight and a half or nine millimeters. So here, after taking away the desmus membrane, you can see how the, this layer looks in real life. This is very resilient. It is translucent. And when you pull it, you can see the striae are going all the way to the periphery. They're telling you that the layer does go to the periphery, but it does not separate as a bubble all the way to the periphery. There's much stronger attachments to the peripheral stroma. Then we did, of course, electron scanning microscopy and other histological examination. You can see this is the edge of the pre desmets layer on scanning EM. This is the desmets membrane with the endothelium. Here again, desmets membrane with the endothelium is separating, and that is the posterior surface of the pre desmets layer that opposes to the desmets membrane. Here again, some other pictures. You can see that's the endothelium, and this is the anterior surface. Uh, of the pre desmets layer. In this scanning EM picture, you can see the pre desmets layer very nicely all the way along. This is a type 1 bubble and some of these strands. And a very large, high power image shows you the pre desmets layer, very different in texture and composition to the deep stroke. And here again, some other pictures. So you can see how these strands are separating along the last row of keratocytes. That arrow shows the keratocyte there and the keratocyte there, and that is the pre desmets layer, that is the desmets membrane, and this is a larger view, so that whole thing is a pre desmets layer there, and that is the desmets membrane, and that's the endothelium, and some of them, when these strands break, they recoil and can form a clump on the surface of the pre desmets layer somewhere there, that's what you see. So we did a lot of morphometry and measurements and established the fibril diameter, the spacing, etc of these uh, uh, layers of collagen within the uh, pre desmets layer. And we also found some of this long spacing collagen as you see over here, which was uh, quite predominant in uh, the, these darker areas in the pre desmets layer. So at that time, we then published this paper called Human Corneal Anatomy Redefined, a normal, novel pre desmets layer. Now that was the original title, but there were, there were Two other people uh, uh, from my department, and then one of our pathologists, uh, Professor James Lowe, and an and, uh, electron microscopist. So Dr. Said said, you know, we've got Bowman's layer and we've got Desmet's member. Why don't we call this Theo's layer? I said, that's not for us to do. We said, no, no, let's just call it. So as an afterthought, we said, all right, why not? And we put it in bracket, Dewar's layer. It immediately went very viral on the internet and all sorts of stories and anecdotes, which I'll leave for another day. But it became the 11th most downloaded paper amongst all papers in medicine and dentistry for that year. And it was in the list of the top 25 papers. Uh, it was 12th overall in the first year after its publication. And people started sending me images. So this is a very interesting image, the image that I'll share you with you from Natalia from Warsaw, this patient had a silver nitrate injury and they did no staining. They had to do a corneograph and they found that everything was brown in the corneograph, but there was this clear zone between the last layer of the stroma and the desmets membrane and endothelium here, you can see quite nicely. There was this clear layer that was not staining with the silver nitrate. And he said, or rather, she said, this convinced me that there is this pre desmets layer, which in this accident of nature we can see is showing itself as a distinct layer. So the, we went on uh, to present our work. And in the UK, there is this Times Higher Education Award, which is presented to the 
best research work done in the year across all the 132 universities in all fields, not just sciences, but even in uh, humanities and geography, you know, agriculture. So amongst all those submissions, uh, we were awarded this Times Higher Education Award for Research Project of Year, which was a very, very big boost to us. And that's the lady, Dr. Said, who said, oh, well, we should call it the name. And that was the other ophthalmologist, uh, the senior registrar working with me at the time. So that's every entrance, every door, a gate to the university in this campus had this uh, banner of the Times Higher Education Award. There were others in other countries. This lady uh, from Paraguay, she borrowed my uh, information and created models of this uh, bubbles. And she uh, presented it at her meeting in Uruguay and won a prize for her. She called it Dua's Membrane. And she took a Skype interview with me. And, and then she presented at the national meeting and she got a prize over there. And then she presented at the international meeting on ocular, uh, you know, on morphophysiology uh, and anatomy. Uh, and there also she won the prize. So a lot of acceptance started to appear amongst a lot of colleagues and peers in different parts of the world. Uh, there were others who became more innovative. This lady, Anita from um, uh, Austria, sent me a six layered cake and she said this green gooey layer is the doer's layer and there were others who made a similar cake this was my own phd student and his wife and they invited us home for dinner and made a, a doer's layer for dessert so the name doer's layer etc although it was highlighted a lot became a controversy and the controversy started with scientific controversies and and challenges as well which were all valid and I'm not criticizing them. I think they actually enrich the, the, the scientific process by which something is eventually validated. Now we had said that this layer is acellular because you can see in this large area, there's not a single cell, but in the strands that break off, you can see some keratocytes. Here's a, another image. The desmus membrane has a lot of endothelial cells. You can see them, but actually in the layer, which is, anterior to it, there were no cells. But others said, oh, no, no, we have seen cells which are very close to the desmus membrane, and it is not the last row of keratocytes because there are cells. And then we countered with this model of the coronary. We said, keratocytes are not arranged in straight lines like soldiers in, in the military do. Keratocytes are randomly scattered. So if you count that as the last layer, then you will find keratocytes beneath it. But if each of these is a layer, then which is the last layer? You know, you wouldn't tell. But if you ask me, the last layer would be uh, of the keratocytes would be this red line joining all these keratocytes together because in nature, nothing is a straight line as one would expect in, shown in the top images. So posterior to that, there is some variable amount of stroma and then you have the pre layer which is over here, which is then the desmus membrane. So that over there is the pre desmus layer, which does not contain any keratocytes. So we were arguing this when, uh, and then others were saying, well, if it is truly there, why don't we see it on OCT? And a good question. But then the answer was provided by the Ziva, uh, Costan Dignica, who is from uh, Waterloo in Canada. Uh, she was working with Leopold Schermitter, and they had a very uh, ultra high resolution OCT. And what she was able to show is that what you see in a normal OCT is this, and bear in mind that in a normal OCT, the decimates and the thelium always appears as two lines. But with the ultra high resolution OCT, again, you will see they appear as two lines, but then you see the last row of keratocytes. This is the picture from her paper, which is marked by the red arrows. And then you have the pre decimates layer there. And this was the first, in vivo demonstration of the layer by OCT. And she then also concluded that it is, in fact, the layer lying beyond the last row of keratocytes, as you see over here. So controversies, questions, and not just me, but others also answering those questions. Coming back to that circular distribution of air, very fascinating, and this is an unresolved issue, which is a topic for further research. Why does the air 
no matter where you inject it in the in the corner, the tip it makes goes back straight in a radial manner to the the needle, or it might go in a radial manner there or there, any what which place or more than once. And then once it reaches the limbus, it goes in the circular manner. And it spreads in the circular manner. And you can see if you do a section there, that's how it looks. So that part of the cornea is more spongy. It has more easily separable lamellae with air compared to the rest of the cornea. And once it makes that circular movement, then it starts to come centrally to, uh, to fill the rest of the cornea. And on scanning EM, you can see that's the limit of the bubble. That area, because the decimus has been cut off, so you can see that area of the pre-decimus layer, which is the same layer carrying on. That area, about one millimeter or so, is corresponding to the area where the air goes circumferentially. So there is something different about that layer. That is the area where the limit of the bubble is. It doesn't go beyond that because the layer is more firmly adherent. And clinically, from doing topography and cadaver eyes, and I'm just telling you some unpublished work, that area corresponds to where the cornea starts to become flat. So the prolate shape of the cornea, centrally curved, peripheral flatter, corresponds to that area where it starts to get flat and then becomes flat. So there is still a lot more about the microanatomy of the cornea that we have to learn, but the clues are all there just by observing how air moves in the stroma. And it's clearly somebody to take on uh, if we don't uh, pursue this any further. But other questions were arisen. And like I said, they were all valid questions. So you've only shown this in adult eyes. What about children? If it is a true layer, it has to be across uh, uh, all ages. And we hadn't because it's very difficult to get children's eyes uh, for, for research work. But I was in Tivandrum giving the Sushruta oration when Vinay Pillay brought this case to me and showed me they had done a perfectly normal valve, but the cornea never cleared. And when they did an OCT, what they found, and you can see there is a detachment over there, and what they found was there is this mixed bubble, but the inner lining, which is the desmets of the mixed bubble, had ruptured. So the pre desmets layer was there completely intact. If the pre dismiss layer is intact and dark, you won't get aqueous sleep. When you open the, take the cornea off, you will see everything looks fine. So you put the new cornea, but it's not going to clear because there is a, a break in the, the dismiss membrane, which is curled as, as normal dismiss does. So this was in a nine year old child where there had been a demonstration in the living eye of the pre dismiss layer and the um, uh, dismiss membrane, the break, and then they did a PK and histology confirmed that. So it's present in children. And then with the help of Amar Agaral, we were able to show that it's present in all ages. We had a three-week-year-old child, a three-week-old child, and a one-year, two-year, four-year, and the nine years I showed you. So it is present in children. Then there was the other bit. You know, So this is the layer without the desmus membrane on it. A perfect example of how a type 1 bubble looks with the desmus membrane has been peeled off. People were saying, oh, this is only residual stroma. It is not a distinct layer. So we said, okay, let's prove that. So if you take cornea like so, and you take away the desmets membrane, and you turn it upside down and make the desmets membrane surface uh, or, uh, convex, and you do PTK to ablate the thin layer of tissue, which is corresponds to the thickness of the pre desmets layer, you ablate it with. Uh, Exam of PTK. Now you inject air. If it is random distribution of tissue, you should get another bubble. But what happens is you never get another bubble. Instead, from small areas there, you can see lots of air escapes through holes in the posterior stroma, which are natural uh, openings or natural places where the collagen separates. But this layer, which is impervious to air, has been ablated. Therefore, you can never raise another bubble. Therefore, it is not residual stroma. So that question was also answered. But then others were working on this layer. Lots of people were skeptical, but others were working on it. And Keith Meek's group found that there's a very high concentration of elastin in the pre desmets layer compared to the rest of the cornea. And they published this work. And they actually used the term uh, to call it the pre desmets layer, because previously they were calling it the so-called pre desmets layer. Now this is it's a pre desmets layer. Now, we then went and, and did a very thorough investigation of elastin 
in the pre-dismissal layer, which answered more clinical questions. So clearly there is more, uh, more elastin in the pre-dismissal layer equal to the trabecular meshwork but even more than in the Desmet's membrane and any other part of the corneum. So that was a chemical extraction and quantification of elastin. But when you do immunohistology, it's amazing what we found. The pre Desmet's layer has more elastin evenly distributed across the whole layer. But look at the Desmet's membrane. Most of the elastin is concentrated as a band on the anterior surface of the Desmet's membrane. And here is what we call the desmis membrane with the pre desmis layer, you can see the desmis membrane doesn't have much. The band is clearly visible, and then you see the pre desmis layer. And if you do the whole cornea section uh, without separating the layers, this is what you see. You can see the pre desmis layer, the interfacial ma matrix, which is the black line, and then the desmis membrane band and the desmis membrane. So the this is a unique demonstration of the. Uh, sorry, the demonstration of the unique distribution of elastin in the Desmet's membrane. Now, we then felt that if you look at how Desmet's membrane scrolls always with the endothelium outside, as you see over here in these images, then what is the explanation? Why does it do that? There were two explanations given. One was in the literature, one was that there is elastin. Yeah, but elastin even here. If you look at this is pre desmis layer, desmis membrane together. This is the wall of a type 1 bubble. And you separate carefully the pre desmis layer, which is here at the desmis. The pre desmis layer hardly scrolls. This one scrolls the most, but the two together scroll intermediate. So that scrolling of the pre desmis layer, which has much more elastin than the desmis, does not occur. All the elastin, uh, all the scrolling is contributed to by the desmis membrane. If you take that away, it doesn't scroll. So just not the presence of elastin, but the distribution is also important. And the other bit we then did is if you put, take this desmet scroll like so, and you put elastase enzyme, gradually in front of your eyes, the whole scroll opens up by itself. As the elastin gets degraded by the elastase enzyme, it unscrolls. And then when you see it becomes completely flat, then when you do a histology of that, you can see the band is fragmented and destroyed. In the control, it is nice and straight. So the destruction of elastin takes away the scrolling characteristic of the desmis membrane, which is so crucial to our understanding of uh, or our performance of the DMEC procedure. The other explanation that was given was that the, the, um, the, the swollen endothelial cells are pushing the desmis membrane to make a, a scroll inward because in post-mortem eyes are either to, uh, allowed to, to swell a bit in the organ culture medium, that's what they will do. So then we said, well, let's check that out. So we took desmis membrane with endothelium. We treat it very lightly with an enzyme called dispase. All the cells detach and can be washed out. You put an F mark to tell you which is the correct side where the endothelium was washed. Out. And then you Take the desmis membrane, put it in DSS, in fact, it will still scroll exactly the same way without any endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells do not contribute to the formation of the scroll. It was purely the elastin. So a lot of things appear in textbook, a lot of things appear in the literature. If you look at the evidence behind that, there isn't. And when you test the evidence, you will find the correct answer, which is what we did in, in this instance. So we determined this the elastin content and distribution that determines the unidirectional scroll of the desmis membrane. And that is what is seen in, in, in this uh, little video clip over here. I hope it works, mm -hmm. let's see, yeah. So if you take the, uh, the, the, the rubber band, okay, this is your pre layer. Mm -hmm. You pull it, sorry, and, and take just the rubber band, your elastin. And then in, in type one bubble, the elasticity of the PDL, it goes down, it comes back. So you, you create a big bubble, and afterwards it settles back. Now, if you put glue on this rubber band and you stretch it and you stick it to that paper, now the paper is the desmets membrane and the rubber band is the anterior elastin band on that. Now, if you look at that and you leave that, you see when they cut the desmets membrane edges, that whole desmets membrane which is stuck with will mm -hmm. curl like that with the endothelium outside. So 
the elastin band, which is inside, is anterior, is going to make it scroll to the cells outside, as demonstrated in this simple example. Now, God didn't put this band over there for us to do DNA. So, what is the physiological role of this elastin band? And my uh, explanation is that this desmus membrane has to attach to the back of the cornea, has to be firmly opposed without any physical attachments between the two. And there are reasons why there shouldn't be physical, otherwise you be tear with every blink or rub or, or, or squeezing of the eyes. And it has to be able to have that shear free interface, yet be completely opposed to it so that it can pump. Now, if the desmus membrane wants to scroll like this, which is in the direction of the elastin band, then that will keep it completely opposed to the back of the, the stroma because that's the direction, and even without any other uh, physical attachments being there. And I think that is the physiological role of the distribution of this elastin, the way it is in the anterior part of the desmus membrane. So all this was the, the, the science behind it. But clinically, how did it make a difference? Hugely. And you can see, you can tell a type 1 bubble when you get it by the roughness. And I showed you that roughness even in the ex vivo, where the desmus absolutely smooth. There is no, no strand, nothing over there. So this is a type 2 bubble. This is a type 1 bubble. It's difficult for me to predict which bubble I'm going to get, although 85% of the time it's, it's a type 1, and the remaining 15% of, of the time it's a type 2 or a mix. But I can tell you which you've got by looking at the two. Why it's important to know? For this reason. If you get a mixed bubble, as you see here, there's a type 1 and a type 2 component, and if you do a paracentesis in the eye, you're going to burst the desmus membrane. Very dangerous. If you get something like this, then if you want to do a paracentesis, you won't come from this side, you'll come from this side, or you'll make a very vertical paracentesis, or you'll wait till you let the air out before you do your paracentesis. Uh, this is, now watch this video. We had a bubble. We didn't know that whether it was a type one or type two. This is pre, uh, pre desmus layer days. And you see, it touched it and the desmets burst. It was clearly a type 2 bubble. Very vulnerable, very fragile, and you can have a complete burst. You can do a very successful dark with a type 2 bubble, but you have to understand that you can rupture it. So keep the pressure low by repeatedly releasing aqueous to your paracentesis. Look at this view video here sent to me by my colleague, Rana Ramesh. He has done a dark. Uh, put the new cornea on, it just pulls the eye to one side, the whole thing bursts open. Again, a type 2 bubble, very, very fragile, has to be handled with extreme care. Now that we know what this is, we have done so many darts successfully with a type 2 bubble because we know how to avoid uh, rupturing it as, as we, did, we did not know in, in these videos. Now, if you do get a tear in a type one bubble, it's not the end of the world. And you can see over here, this was a type one bubble dark. There was a tear, and this tear does not scroll in. I'm putting my cannula through the tear and putting reinflating the, the AC. If it was desmets, it would have ripped through. So if you have a type one bubble, it's much more forgiving. And all we had to see afterwards is this fold. There was a little uh, laxity in the pre-desmets layer, so there was a wrinkle. But otherwise, the dark was good in that patient. Uh, it, it offers this plane of cleavage. There's a distinct plane of cleavage between the pre desmets layer and the deep stroma. And you can see if the bubble does not go all the way to the periphery, you can actually physically follow that plane. And this is a, a, a video uh, sent by Adik Parikh from Mumbai. And you can see how those strands you can encounter. I showed you earlier. Those strands you have to just release and then reach the periphery of your bubble. If you have an eccentric trepanation, it will be more difficult to do this because the bubble will form in the center. And I can, I can show you that the predestinous layer is much more strongly attached the further to the periphery you go. Now, sometimes you are in a clinical situation like this, a lot of learning points here. So you, the needle is in, and this is me, and I've gone straight into the ACE. Now, do I stop the dial? No, I'll go to another point and inject, and I get a very small type one bubble. Now put viscoelastic and puncture it because it's flat. I don't want to puncture the desmets underneath. And I've got a pocket. 
and I know I've got the right plane. So I will put viscoelastic in with a spatula. I will completely go along that plane and you can see beautifully separation of the predestinates there equal to what we would have had you got a, a type one bubble. So remember, there is this plane of cleavage which you can exploit even to a small bubble, even half the size I showed you. Once you're in the plane, your spatula will go easily and you can successfully complete it out. This is amazing uh, video from Rishi Swaroop in Hyderabad. They were trying to do visco doubt, but it didn't work. So they finally just peel the thing off. You can see mm -hmm. how you can peel the whole anterior stroma off the predesmiss layer and it comes off uh, uh, after deep trephination and this, that layer will withstand that much force, exploiting the plane of cleavage. And not just surgeons, even fungi do that. Fungal keratitis was shown by Liu et al. to spread along the predesmiss plane. And we looked at this histology and we said, okay, if you say so, an important observation. And he said it provides a pathological support for doers finding and adding clinical meaning to the new anatomical concept of the predestined layer. But we ourselves have now seen it. You go back and look at your patients and remember for the future, if you see a <coughs> corneal ulcer that is not responding, you do an OCT and you see this separation of the predestined layer is most likely fungal. Deep or keratitis profunda with fungal keratitis, the plane will separate and you can detect that on OCT. Very important clue, which is an additional bit of evidence helping you to make your diagnosis. And for me, this is the most important um, application of the layer or the, the, what the layer has taught us. We have been looking at Desmus membrane detachment for you know, hundreds of years. But desmus membrane detachment is not detachment of the desmus membrane alone. It is in three types. You have the type 1, which is like the type 1 bubble. You have a type 2, which is like the type 2 bubble, only desmus membrane. And sometimes it can be torn to give you a curl. And you have the mixed one or the type 3, where yeah, the predesmus layer has separated and the desmus membrane has separated and both have also separated from each other. So desmus membrane detachment can have the detachment of the predestinates layer as well, as you see in the type one, there's the two together and the mixed where the two together but also separated from each other. And this is not a concept we had in mind when we were teaching. And, and this is a huge implication for treatment of desmus membrane detachment. And just to show you some examples, this was one over here, you can see when it appears like a straight cord of a circle, a straight line, it's most likely the combined predestinates layer, as you see there, desmus membrane and endothelium. And if it appears wavy, then it is like a type two detachment, only desmus membrane. If you see a strand extending from the posterior stroma to the uh, detached desmus membrane, it's definitely the predestinates layer because you never get a strand from the stroma to the desmus membrane. And if you can see over here, predestinates layer detachment and then the desmus membrane detached with the curled edge. So there was a mixed detachment with a, a tear, so it's a regmatogenous. Here again, you can see quite nicely, two layers are detached and they are not a split, they are pre PDL and the desmus membrane. Then we talk about desmetocele. A vast majority of our desmetocele are not just desmus membrane. They have this layer of predesmus layer on it. And sometimes they have more than predesmus stroma, but when the knuckle of the desmets comes through shiny, then you know it's only desmets. And then it is more vulnerable to perforation. But as long as the predestined layer is on it, it is less vulnerable to perforation. And again, this concept, you know, we will think about this and, and time will tell in history how we can get a concept wrong for hundreds of years. And then we suddenly realized that we were, what we were saying was all wrong. In our very first paper, we wrote, because we had seen these pictures, these are my patient images, that acute hydrops is not due to tear in the desmus membrane, it is due to tear in the desmus membrane and the predesmus layer. And we, we mentioned this in our first paper. And others did not agree with it, or well, they did not agree that the layer exists. And you can see over here on OCT, the desmus membrane, predesmus layer, and the both are torn, and you got acute high drops. So uh, there are examples of that, I uh, won't go into detail, even with pellucid, you can see, and here's a detachment with a tear, with a strand, 
And that strand tells you this is the pre-dismissed layer that has detached and torn and so forth. And based on that, uh, Professor Muren came up with a treatment and he said, if you go deep in and suture the pre-dismissed layer and approximate it without suturing the decimates, you can still get resolution of acute hydrops. drops. But this was the most telling paper. It's important for two reasons. One, it is Janet Mellis's paper. He's the, you know, as you know, the, the father of all uh, posterior lamellar surgery and given us so much new stuff. Uh, he was very skeptical about the layer until he himself showed that acute hydrops is due to tear in both desmets membrane and the pre desmets layer. And this is his paper where he showed in keratoconus eyes during surgery or a Bowman's transplant, if the desmets membrane detaches, you don't get acute hydrops. And if it tears, you don't get acute hydrops. But if he's doing Bowman's transplant and the spatula goes straight through the stroma into the, the cornea, tearing the pre desmets layer, then you get acute hydrops even intraoperatively. So he was convinced, therefore, that acute hydrops, and he did, to be fair, mention, as we had mentioned in our paper, is due to tear in the desmets membrane and the pre desmets layer. And then he wrote that paper, and we wrote a, a letter to him because we had already done this experiment. If you take a human eye bank eye and you cut the posterior surface, you're cutting the desmets and pre desmets layer, you mount it on an artificial anterior chamber and you raise the pressure really high, you don't get eye drops. So not just you need a tear in the desmets and the pre desmets layer, but in the context of the altered glycosaminoglycans and altered collagen of a creatoconus cornea. Only then you get acute hydrox. So you need three things, not two. And then we wrote a letter in, in that context uh, saying what I just told you. And they replied back saying, we're gratified to see that a recent article has generated so much interest in uh, former thinkers in the field, et cetera, et cetera. And saying we 100% agree with what they've said. So you can see how the acceptance came slowly, slowly in some quarters, very quickly in other quarters. We went on to uh, show that you can do a dark operation under the, uh, you could do a cataract operation under uh, the layer. It is strong enough to take the pressures of uh, take emulsification. And we call this the triple dark, as you can see over here. And these are some examples of that. And we also then able to show that this construct that you get of the pre desmets layer and the desmets membrane can be excised. And that curls much less than the desmets, as I showed you earlier and can be used for endothelial keratoplasty. And that was the birth of the, the PDEC, the pre desmets endothelial keratoplasty procedure, which uh, has this video in the article in the BJO. And you can see you can peel off that and that PDEC tissue, when you put it in this, grows much less than a DMET tissue. So at that point, uh, when, when uh, Amar wanted to start doing this operation, he said, let's call it Dewar's layer endothelial transplant. I said, no, no, there's a lot of controversy on the name. Don't use Dewar's layer. Let's call it pre endothelial keratoplasty. And the name became PDEC. And then same lady who uh, I showed you earlier, the side said, when the dust settled, we will call it Prof Dewar's endothelial keratoplasty. It will still be PDEC. So the, the name controversy continued uh, through, the, through the years that followed the discovery. Uh, I'm mentioning this uh, only to show you how it extended our knowledge that the pre layer, the desmets membrane ends here, but the pre layer carries on as the core of the trabecular meshwork. You can see this is the pre layer and that's the trabecular meshwork. It, it is continuous. So the pre layer does not end in the periphery. It becomes the trabecular meshwork like the scarf. So the same tissue which is making that becomes uh, the, the trabecular meshwork. And we, we showed a lot, of, I'll not go into detail, but this is important that right at the periphery where the pre desmets layer starts to become the trabecular meshwork, there are fenestrations. These fenestrations are very important. Why they're important? Because you can see over here now, there's a very high power of the periphery of the pre desmets layer. There are, there are these fenestrations and the start of the trabecular meshwork. If your desmets membrane is attached here and you inject air in the anterior chamber, some of it will go in the anterior chamber. And all of us who do dark know that air gets into the anterior chamber. But if the desmets membrane is attached here, then this air escapes anterior to the desmets membrane and you get a type two bubble. And that's why most type two bubbles start at the periphery and 
even though this layer is impervious to air, air goes and posterior to this layer through these fenestrations to lift the desmus membrane to cause the type 2 bubble. So that is the physiology, that is the anatomy, that is the fact. So based on that, we then developed a clamp. So if you want to do PDEC, you don't want a type 2 bubble. So you can clamp these fenestrations with the PDEC clamp and you can then inject air and you will see that there is no air escaping to the periphery and you will find that you get a very nice uh, a type 1 bubble which you can excise and do the PDEC operation. And there are other ways of doing the same thing. And this is just a PDEC operation where we're taking this uh, tissue out uh, in loading it into the cartridge. You can load it into any cartridge. This was the, the lens cartridge, and you inject it into the patient's eye, and then you flatten it exactly like you do for a DMEC. Uh, you can use air to flat open it, or you can tap it, and then you put it on, and you can see that you get uh, some pretty good outcome with PDEC. And uh, Amar Agarwal, uh, thanks to him, this procedure has been popularized considerably across the world and eye banks in the states are now preparing and providing pre-prepared PDEC tissue. Now at this point, I'm just going to finish off with this little, little story. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yanov from the Yanov and Fine book said that we have found that Dr. Fine in his book, uh, which was the second edition of Yanov and Fine, page 176, figure 9.26, has shown an image in which this layer is being illustrated. So in recognition of your work and that of Dr. Fine, we plan to designate the corneal region, the fine dua corneal layer in our in the eighth edition, which is the latest edition of the book. And, uh, and we suggest, we plan to suggest this terminology for approval at the meeting of the American Association of Ophthalmic Oncologists and Pathologists, and that we would recommend that this terminology should be used uh, in all papers and in all presentations. And he said, is that okay? Now, I hadn't even seen that email because it was buried in my email. I didn't. I got the second email which said, congratulations, the AOP has now uh, accepted the terminology, but they changed it around. They now called it the do of fine layer. And that's what we're going to call it. Congratulations on this great honor. For me, I said, it doesn't make a difference because the debate has shifted from whether the layer is there or not to what it should be called, which is fine. And whether it's doer fine or fine doer, but it's, it's the layer is being accepted. And this is their book where it is now called the doer's layer, they, they took pictures. But if you go back to that image that you referred to where they saw the layer for the first time, yeah, it's there, you know, that's the desmus membrane. And then you see over there, pre desmus layer, and then the rest of the stroma. So it is there, but if you look at the image, that image is taken, it's modified from McTeague's image of 1967, which was published in 76. And there is not a single word or an arrow or a comment on that layer. It's just that it's over there. And if you go back to work of others, you can see the same thing. This is Marshall's work. He's looking at the, the development of the Desmus membrane over time. And that's, you know, in a 20 week fetus, five day old child, so forth. You can see that layer below the last row of keratocytes. It's there and it gets thicker with age. I said it is a, this is not an invention, it's a discovery. When you discover something, you go back to any image, however far back it might be, it will still be there. So it's not that, and I, I give the example, you know, if Newton saw the apple falling and discovered gravity, and then people can say to him, oh, I saw the apple falling before Newton, therefore, I discovered gravity is not the correct argument. But anyway, not all of them have taken that view. This is the latest book by John Forrester et al. And what they have, he's called a separate section on Dewar's layer and taken some images from our publication elsewhere too in the textbook to talk about the layer. So there is, a, this was an image published about the layer, just talking about the layer, the controversy and acceptance. Uh, there are a, a group of anatomists who say we should take away all names from all uh, anatomical feature, which is fine. And I think that is the way forward. So the Bowman's is called the anterior limiting lamina. The Desmets is called the posterior limiting lamina. So the Dewar's layer or the pre Desmets layer should be called the pre posterior limiting lamina layer or P2L3. Uh, you know, uh, 
like for that kabhi khushi kabhi gab, they call it k2 g3 or something so it'll be p2 l3 and that's probably what we will probably go on to call it so whenever to all those who are looking at new things discovering things finding things whenever something new is put forward this is a natural response one response it can't be true the other response it has been described before the third response i've described it before and the fourth response is okay let's check it out and see and then it leads to the process of ver verification validation and either uh, discard it or accept it and fortunately most people fall in category 4 although this layer like all other discoveries has gone through all these four types of uh, of uh, accusations or uh, um, comments and then we be able to come to the truth uh, so in in the context of this it has been described before there was an editorial right at the time we first published it, but there is nothing new under the sun by Jester and Manis at all. And I had replied to the editorial by saying, there is nothing new under the sun, but the sun is constantly shining new light on old objects. So we come back around to the same things, same procedures we do with modern technology, we do them better. So even though there were layers there, the people must have seen something, but to define it the way it is and to then make it clinically applicable and applicable in clinical conditions and pathology then makes a quantum change from one concept uh, of ancient times to modern era. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention, giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you. So that's a summary just to reinstate some of the major points that I have said. It's been really a pleasure. Sorry, I've overrun a bit, but uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share this with you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. We will always keep it in our hearts and this will be memorable. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Now I request uh, Professor JSTT also to kindly come up with his talk, sir. I think Dr. Dua has to unshare, no? He's unshared. Yes. Okay. The, the screen has not come up, sir, yet. I, I have I have stopped sharing a while ago. Okay, okay. Not coming up. Huh? Uh, so you have the share screen option on the on the application from which you have joined here. Mm. If you share screen and uh, select the presentation that you are going to share, and you have to click share once again there. Mm. I'm not getting it. This is a new one for me, new uh, laptop. No, no, sir. Please take your time. We are sir, on the screen ID, now. Sir. On the screen where you see the mute and mute option yeah. and the start. Wait, I have option. that. Uh, yeah. I think I'll have to. Uh,
<coughs> Sorry, it's not showing my you know desktop in the share screen one. Can the, the admin help me? Uh, how do I give the permission uh, to do? If you know, if we just mouse yeah. mouse over the Zoom screen. Apple. Starting of it. Hello. Uh, sir, have you opened your PPT? Uh, it's, it's opened. Actually, this is okay. uh, I've just changed my you know laptop today only. No problem, sir. Uh, uh, I didn't check. No problem, sir. So, uh, uh, are you on a Zoom application? Don't uh, minimize your presentation. Come I to the know. Zoom application. From the taskbar yeah. at the bottom, you yeah. will be able to see the blue color video icon. Uh, are you in a Zoom application where you can see Dr. Prashant and all? Yeah, I can see them. Yeah, yeah uh, there is a green button down at the bottom which says share screen. Oh, I'm, I'm pressing that. Okay. But uh, it doesn't show my screen. No, uh, that, uh, your presentation screen it is not showing, correct? Yeah. So you can able to see the screen right now over there. <laughs> Showing the you know, uh, basic, advanced, and five three correct. things. Correct. Correct. So in the basic, there uh, the first option would be a screen. Which in the again, basic, I'm, I'm getting a desktop. Is uh, 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 the question mark on a desktop? On a basic. Uh, once I press a basic uh, uh, this thing icon, uh -huh. it's showing you know uh, desktop, whiteboard, okay. iPhone. Microsoft PowerPoint unknown. In the desktop, it is showing a question mark, you know, a blue uh, icon. Okay, uh, just select on that. Hmm. Select and uh, press share on it. It says uh, open system preference, security and pri privacy to okay. grant access. Uh, okay. So should it I is... press open system preference? No, sir. It is basically asking for the uh, approvals from the laptop itself. Okay, uh, stop sharing once and again uh, click on share. Green one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, go to the uh, MS PowerPoint presentation over there. Okay. Press share. It's showing again the same thing? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. laptop, your laptop is not allowing the application to. Okay, you can go to the uh, settings right now. Can you? Can you uh, okay, so I've come to you know security and privacy. Take the permission from the sir from by any desk. Accessibility. Yes, you need to give the accessibility. Uh, Prashant sir, uh, can anybody else share the uh, SERS presentation? If somebody else have the SERS presentation. Okay. I think you're not allowed now. Let me see if I can share now.
you know, if it's on a new laptop and Zoom is not installed, it would not probably have uh, got all the application functions going. So actually, it is the system preferences that has to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, due to which it is not allowing uh, sir to share the presentation. Yeah. Uh, sir, if you can share the presentation with any of your other uh, panel members here, so that they can share the presentation on your behalf, sir. You can either share by the mail or you can uh, you can transfer the presentation so that they can share on your behalf. The person you are calling is not answering. Please call again later. Aap jis vyakti ko call kar rahe hai, vah abhi call nahi le pa rahe hai. Kripya kuch samay baad call kare. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, sir. We can able to see your yes, slides. Please okay. continue. Uh, now, uh, how do you make a slide show? It, it looks like it is a slideshow. It's in the slideshow. Okay. Okay, if you are seeing the thing, I can start now. Uh, can you just uh, go to the next slide? Oh, it's not <laughs> uh, just click on the click on the screen once uh, and just go to the next okay now it will come uh, are you able to see uh, at the bottom uh, left hand side uh, arrow of left and uh, going forward and come yes okay now it's, it's running yeah uh, we just, yes, okay, sir. yes sir yes sir okay thank you thank you i think i can do it thank now yeah. sorry for thank all you. the trouble because this is a brand new uh, laptop i've no changed issues. today only <laughs> thank you no, sir, so thank every, please sir everything please. I, had, I had copied from my previous laptop but uh, still i had problem anyway uh, thank you uh, yeah, the please, entire sir. bhu team for a very kind invitation and i've been part of uh, maybe most of your you know foundation day programs and yes, many many congratulations <laughs> to the you no know, team uh, headed by you know uh, dr singh who's been a wonderful uh, leader of the entire gang and all the faculty members and after listening to uh, professor duwas talk and the discovery he has made changed the lifestyle the surgical style of all the cornell uh, surgeons and uh, in, in fact uh, changing the entire anatomy concept of a cornea by you know uh, discovering that uh, pre decimetric layer which is now known as the duwas layer and we are all proud of that achievement and uh, let me talk something little different which is also played in a cornea uh, that is a laser refractive surgery on a cornea so i'll just go uh, uh, not by layer by layer by the, the techniques which we have been described there are no financial disclosure for my side if you look into the entire journey of uh, refractive surgery in fact it is now almost more than 100 years where refractive surgery has been there and uh, you all know right from the incisional surgeries to now uh, refractive lenticular extraction which is known as a smile there has been a sea change in a concept of a refractive surgery but if you look at outcome wise all these surgeries have given a, a wonderful outcome for people who are undergoing refractive procedures and in fact if you look into right from the surface ablation to a lenticular extraction 
they are still being practiced by the surgeons. But that indicates that whatever reflective surgery have been evolved in last uh, few decades, they still are applicable. So I would say there are few names which are very, very important, but it is uh, not important for uh, how things are shifted. But we all know, all, all of them deserve the accolades for uh, changing the entire concept. When we started doing a laser refractive procedure, we didn't have the concept of various indices which will govern the outcome of refractive procedure in our patients. I think th this is one thing which has changed now. We are looking for uh, actually cases who are coming for refractive procedure, not only for a, a laser refractive procedure, for other refractive procedure like uh, faking IOLs, it is very important to screen the cornea of these patients. So it, that is one thing where we are looking for subclinical ectasia. If patient has a keratoconus, we know that we can't do laser refractive procedure. So we are looking for a subclinical indices which can point to us, okay, this is a normal patient which may uh, sustain the laser refractive procedure cornea. I will not have any future problems which may be there despite having to uh, uh, screening them in a uh, nice manner, but some patient may still have an ectasia subsequent to a laser procedure. Therefore, all these indices does have a value. So we started with a just simple topographic indices, which are still applicable. Then we had a tomograph tomographical indices, which is basically bad T and ARTS. Now it is combined with a biomechanical indices that makes a threefold inquiry into the corneal structure, its morphological feature, to really say, okay, this is a suitable patient. So this is what we are looking for. We are looking for an anterior corneal curvature, posterior corneal curvature, pachymetry. Apart from that, we are also looking for epithelial mapping nowadays, and ultimately the biomechanical strength that is a corneal hysteresis. All these combines will give us a new ways to look into the cornea. So this is what we are looking for. I think uh, everything is now in one particular slide here, which has, you can see a four quad map of a cornea through pentacam, which tells you the anterior, posterior, the corneal uh, curvature power map and the thickness map all together. And subsequently you have a enhanced ectasia display of belly and ratio, which gives you a actual most important parameter of bad D. And subsequent to that, now we are working on to the corvus, which gives you a biomechanical indices of the cornea along with uh, tomography indices also. If you, I look into a, a case here, this is a, a one case which is normal. You can see the previous case was absolutely normal. You can see all the indices are normal, bad D is normal and the TBI, CBI, that is a corneal biomechanical indices and tomography indices were normal in this patient. But subsequent to that, this is another case where you can see that CBI, that is a biomechanical indices are normal, but other indices are abnormal. So this is a case which is a borderline case for a suspect of ectasia. Such cases would be either required to be seen subsequently in next six months, one year, or you have some other options of doing a, a sort of a cross-linking along with the laser application in these cases. So this is what uh, we have uh, charted out the way we look into our patient coming to us, us for a refractive surgery, especially a laser refractive procedure. So we have three indices now with us, a D value, corneal biomechanical indices, or a tomographic biomechanical indices. So if these three indices are available, if they are normal, so this is a patient suitable for all types of refractive procedure, classic, PRK, smile, or if patient has a high refractive error, patient can go for a the fake IL implantation also. But if you have any one of these indices are abnormal, that means one is abnormal, two indices are normal. So this is a borderline case where the frank ectasia is not picked up in your routine examination and investigation because in rot routine examination, as said, we can't pick up the early ectasia or a subclinical cases. We require a tomography indices there. I would recommend these patients to be seen or a followed up for next six months to look for a progression. And that will be picked by these three indices as such. If there are no progression subsequently, your indices remain same, then you might consider doing a procedure which doesn't weaken the cornea that much. 
So that will be surface ablation like PRK, or we do a smile or LASIK extra in these cases to give a, some sort of a, a strengthening of a cornea in these cases. If all the parameters are abnormal, like abnormal D value, abnormal CBI and TBI, so either this case is a subclinical keratoconus, so this case requires a longer follow-up and to be seen. Subsequently, definitely these patients will have these indices going abnormal subsequently. Or a patient can have a frank keratoconus, then laser refractive procedure may not be desirable in such cases. You may have to do a cross-linking of these cases to stop the progression of keratoconus and look for some other ways to rehabilitate this patient. So let, briefly take into surface ablative procedure. We all know it has been a, one of the oldest uh, refractive procedure, came before uh, uh, flap surgeries, but still many, many centers across the world do a large number of patients with surface ablation also. What has changed in the last few decades? We used to remove the uh, epithelium mechanically or use alcohol-assisted uh, removal. But in recent time, people are using a, a single stage procedure that is an examen laser transepithelial PRK, which is the normal way now we also uh, do in these cases. For that, the important thing is you need to assess the corneal epithelium because once you use a laser in a PTK mode to remove the epithelium, the thickness or a pattern of epithelium should be assessed in all these patients. You can't uh, blindly take up 50 microns as a corneal epithelial thickness. If you see here, there are two uh, epithelial patterns of a patient. In this patient, the, you look into uh, the range of thickness from center to periphery changes grossly, which is more than at least eight, milli, uh, eight uh, change. If you look into a micron wise, central and peripheral thickness is more than eight micron difference. So this has a differential epithelial thickness. So if, if you take just 50 microns, it may not uh, work out. So you have to modify your thickness in your parameter in these cases. But see the subsequent slide here, it has a uniform corneal thickness of uh, 52. So this is a good case for a trans epithelial, uh, epithelial uh, PRK to be done in these cases. So this one thing we have learned now, for if you're doing a PRK, the epithelial mapping or thickness has to be assessed appropriately. But this was a uh, video may not work now in this case. This is this was a uh, video of a trans epithelial PRK. And uh, we used to do alcohol assisted earlier, which is no longer being practiced because alcohol has its own problems. It can have a apoptosis to uh, the cells which are there in the cornea. It can also delay the healing. Patient can have more painful uh, episodes subsequently. Uh, chances of uh, uh, complications like uh, epithelial uh, defect persisting for a longer time, infection happening is much more in these cases. As far as haze is concerned, we are not sure if alcohol will cause more haze or less haze. It's not been you know, studied that well. So we all know LASIK uh, over uh, PRK over LASIK uh, in terms of a uh, slow recovery would be the major challenge for a PRK results, but you are saving the much more corneal tissue. You are leaving the cornea stronger. There's no flap, therefore flap-related complication will not be there in these PRK patients. And yes, it is suitable for thin cornea with normal indices. So you have a thinner cornea, but normal indices, you can do a PRK as such. But you all know any cornea less than 470 microns, laser procedures are not normally uh, recommended in these cases. So if I have a cornea 500 or 490, PRK may, may be a better option if this is a normal. Once we consider PRK, in some cases you can have a haze, recovery may be slow. So what is that procedure we can give you a faster recovery, better predictability, that is a flap-based procedure or a LASIK, uh, which has come subsequently in our practice. So you can do a flap uh, with the help of uh, a microkeratome. You can do a flap with the help of femtosecond laser devices also. And both have advantages and disadvantages, and both are being practiced. But as far as the future is concerned, people have to shift to a femtosecond laser flap creation, you know, subsequent uh, cases, because it has its own advantages over microkeratome, because it is a much more precise, more predictable than a keratome uh, head as such. And this gives you a very nice uh, uniplanar picture uh, of uh, entire flap making. So these are four steps which are normally there like microkeratome. 
you can select the various sizes of a suction ring depending of uh, uh, the ethnicity and size of a cornea that is white to white and you can have a different type of keratome which is suitable for your patients the flap thickness can also be uh, considered in these patients depending on the thickness of cornea grossly 120 micron head or 140 micron head will comfortably being used but newer generation uh, keratomes can give you a very thin flap also you can see this is how a femtosecond uh, devices change from 2000 onwards we had uh, uh, we started with you know around uh, 15 30 kilohertz systems now uh, intralase has 150 kilohertz systems but if you look into other ways the type of uh, energy which is delivered to create the flap is also very important so we know that if you have a high frequency low energy that gives you a more precise uh, spot uh, uh, distance and lesser damage to the surrounding structure the predictability outcome will be better and recovery will be also faster in these cases so all newer generation system will have a high uh, frequency and low energy like you have fem2 ldb gma which is uh, uh, because you have 5 megahertz system and gives you a very fast application also it will give you the flap which will be much more regulated in these cases so if you look into a precise precise precision and predictability grossly microkeratome will be as good as fem2 second but we know that the type of flap created by fem2 second would be much better if you see here this is a fem2 second created flap a uniplanar flap therefore the meniscus type flap which is created by macrocarotome would have some sort of a higher order abrasion in these cases which will be slightly more than a femtosecond creation your outcomes can be affected by these and in terms of predictability why you know that uh, the thickness variability will be much more with the macrocarotome where it can go plus minus 40 microns and that will be a uh, difficult especially in a cases where your corneal thickness is borderline and when you calculate pta that is a percentage tissue altered which is basically based on the thickness of a cornea and tissue which is been ablated so if you have a the flap creation gets little hair wire which can happen in a macrocarotome as i said it can range from a 20 to 40 micron difference then what you actually calculated and in femtosecond creation it will be plus minus 5 to 8 micron therefore it will be a much more safer in cornea which is borderline for your consideration outcome wise visual acuity outcomes are if you look into literature it is comparable microcarotome and a femtosecond flap wise the safety wise i think femtosecond laser flaps are much more safer in long term wise also because they have a better additions less an induction definitely better in these cases this is what uh, if you compare the various uh, devices of fem2 second laser which makes a flap as i talked about uh, the newer generation uh, gmer uh, laser which has a high frequency and low energy we definitely give you a better outcome for a visual acuity and recovery wise and the uh, higher order ablation wise in these cases laser application also you all have seen we have uh, grossly from broad beam to now we have come to a flying spot technology which can be customized to a cases which can be give you a, a wavefront guided ablation or it can optimize your treatment or it can give you a, a sort of a topo guided application also and that was possible by a flying flying spot technology being coming to our practice in a exam laser these are various devices which are applicable uh, and available for practice for us and all of them have a, a good uh, parameters in terms of uh, suitability for these cases and i think the change which has happened in a towards the early uh, uh, 2000 we had a better eye tracking system faster eye tracking systems which could give you a, a response rate which is less than 3 milliseconds if you see if you look into a, the older generation which worked on a 60 to 330 hertz system the response rate would be around 36 milliseconds while the newer generation which is around 1050 hertz uh, trackers the response rate is less than 3 milliseconds therefore your horizontal vertical cyclotorsion static and dynamic cyclotorsion can be you know picked up by these trackers outcome will be definitely better in these cases so that's the change which has happened as such 
But if you look into all type of laser which has been used, the outcomes are almost within the FDA guideline for most of these cases. So if you have any device that is applicable to you, it would give you a better uh, result as such. You must have heard various uh, talks in the last you know, so many years where people talk about customized corneal ablation. I think which is also appropriate to discuss here. We do all routine lasers, but which are those cases where customized ablation will be required or it should be done in those cases. So that will depend on our preoperative assessment of your patient, where you look into a two area, that is a visual quality of your patient, which is based on a higher order ablation. If it is a normal range higher order ablation, like you see here, then you can do any way, any type of treatment, which can be simple optimized, wavefront optimized treatment, or these cases can also be taken away top, topo guided ablation also. But if you have a patient with a visual quality is not satisfactory because the patient has higher, higher ablation, they have a symptoms of glare and halos. So these patients will be taking them for a wavefront analysis assess. If your wavefront analysis gives higher order ablation more than 0.4, then you look for what type of HOA they have. If it is a predominantly corneal higher order ablation, so these patients are suitable for a topo guided ablation. So you can see predominantly corneal higher order ablation, we'll do a topo guided ablation. If they have both internal and corneal higher order ablation, so these cases may be better for a simple wavefront guided treatment as such. So that is a two classical differentiation. If you have a pure corneal wavefront uh, problems, that is higher order ablation corneal, then we can use topographic treatment. But if you have a patient who has additional internal ablations, then this patient is suitable for a wavefront guided ablation as such. So it is two things are important for topographic ablation. One is that you have to acquire a good quality images, so scans from uh, your topolyzer. Once you have a good images, then that is can be taken up for a topographic ablation because that is a primary uh, requisite for a topographic ablation. Second is the difference between your, uh, between the, your manifest and topo refraction should be uh, almost similar to achieve a good results. So these are two important things before we jump for a topographic ablation in those patients where you have a corneal wavefront, which is higher. So these are the results which have been published. This is a FDA trial where they found that uh, almost 93% would get 2020 by one year, which is a very good uh, assessment. And if you look into uncorrected visual acuity of 2016, that is almost 65%, which is a very good outcome for a topographic patient. But uh, if you look into a short term refractive visual outcomes, it is as compared to a routine wavefront or a aspheric treatment, which you normally do on these patients. But if you look long term results, these topographic ablation patients would do better because their visual, visual results, outcomes keep improving as time passes. So if I see a one-year results of topographic versus a wavefront optimized treatment, topographic might do better at one year. What about those patients where, as I said, topographic refraction and your uh, manifest refraction doesn't match? In those cases, forcitis analytic has come up, which is... Uh, which takes into consideration not only the corneal astigmatism, it looks into your topographic irregularity as we measure from a topolyzer, and also takes into higher order ablation from a posterior corneal astigmatism as well as lenticular astigmatism also. So basically, this looks into the entire internal uh, ablation which has happened. Apart from that, the corneal ablation, both anterior and posterior corneal uh, parameters are also taken into, and this is sort of a, a AI-based algorithm and the results seem to be better in those cases where topographic and manifest reflection are not matching. So this will have a higher number of patients getting suitable for topographic ablation. The results are better, in fact, as good as a normal uh, patient where we have done a top topographic ablation as such. There are multiple complications can be there in any procedure. That is true for a LASIK also, but these are very, very rare. And sometimes uh, you can differentiate between femtosecond and macular keratome in terms of they have a unique complication with them. And flap dislocation can occur in a, both the group of cases, but it is much more common in the macular keratome assisted surgery. This was one of our patients who had undergone LASIK procedure. I just wanted to show this case because he's undergone LASIK procedure five years back. And subsequently he had an injury 
and poor fellow after injury he could not come to the hospital he came came to the hospital after one year of injury because of uh, lockdown happening these cases so you can see entire flap had dislocated superiorly with lot of fibrosis and had a large epithelial growth also so this flap could not be reposited back or could not be flattened because it's only fibrous and wrinkled and epithelial in growth this was a, a topographic picture in this patient totally abnormal this is oct showing a large epithelial in growth apart from the flap getting totally dislocated superiorly in this case so this is what uh, the picture was on the table where i had to do a, a amputation of entire flap and this is a normal stoma which is got epithelialized and this entire epithelial defect i could remove and left this patient uh, flapless and to our surprise uh, removing the flap the patient did very well despite removing the you know the flap which uh, was around 200 micron thickness the vision which was 624 earlier improved subsequently to 69 after a few months after one week and subsequently after one month the patient did better this was the immediately after one week you can see a thickening of a uh, central area steepening also and this uh, same patient did quite well subsequently after one month after three months now the follow up is one year so this is being published in a indian journal of ophthalmology as a case report showing that long standing dislocation of flap gets totally fibrous and it is not viable and if you have a sub along with that if you have a in growth then you have to manage in different manner this is a technique we described when the ioct microscope can give you a better assessment of uh, epithelial in growth the approach can be changed as per the required uh, assessment on the table these are two unique compli unique complication which is seen in a femtosecond laser uh, flap up making as dr duval is talking about the uh, pre decimetic layer going up to the trabecular mesh work so similarly when we do a laser application the bubble can go to the entry chamber through that mesh work uh, area and this is the intra camera bubble coming up when you make the flap and once you have these bubbles your tracker tracker doesn't work and you may have to postpone your surgery for some time or the next day or you can have these bubble which don't come out from this tunnel which you make for escape of bubble and they go anteriorly and these uh, obl can really decrease your outcome in some of your patient if they approach right in the middle of your optical axis because all treatment is normally pupil centered in our patients or sometime like you have a button hole in a macular keratom you can have anterior uh, vertical gas break through happening in these cases and you can see here you have a nice flap making but this area you have it has come anteriorly and you have a large uh, defect where you may have to postpone your surgery for a few months so that you have a normal regular appearance and do a, either a macular keratom or a you can do a prk or you can do repeat this uh, laser ab ablation flap kind of going little deeper which is normally 20% deeper than the previous uh, flap you have made and at least uh, larger by 0.5 mm in, in terms of flap size in these cases so lasik you all know it has own, own complications makes the cornea weaker the flap can get uh, dislodged any time even after uh, 15 20 years of surgery though we know that the recovery of vision is very fast outcome is very very predictable and this is the largest number of surgery which is done uh, in around the world and it still is one of the preferred surgery for us also but it can induce more dry eyes because you are cutting the uh, almost 270 degrees of cornea nerve plexus recovery recovery of nerve plexus also delayed in these cases and the cornea getting weaker is another important therefore the chances of ictasia is much higher i think the invention of surgical modality in terms of a flap to cap has given us a new dimension of looking surgery this is approved in 2016 by fda subsequently we know that it can take away the large amount of myopia astigmatism also approved up to 3 diopters now and similarly hyperopic studies are going on i'm pretty sure it will be approved very soon for uh, correction in smile also but looking into a decision making wise because amount of a tissue which has been removed in smile and lasik are almost similar the only difference is here is a cap therefore only the uh, incision site which may be 2 mm to 4 mm depending on a surgeon's comfort 
you are not cutting the large area in these cases. Therefore, we presume that a biomechanical stent may be better in smile than the elastic patient. Those patients who have a contact sports, or those people who have a defense job, they might be more suitable for a smile procedure. But I know that if a patient has a hyperopia or a high astigmatism, or a patient has required a post-refractive surgery enhancement, where you predict in those cases, elastic or PRK may be a better option as such. It does have a huge learning curve. This is our paper. We assess them for a uh, initial 100 eyes, and there's a certain decrease in the number of uh, complications happening after you do a 50 eyes to begin with. And stepwise surgery is very, very simple in these cases. The suction there is very light in the uh, smile patients. So therefore, the suction loss can happen in some of your patients. And the technique uh, we describe to make it simpler for people to understand because it is very difficult to understand what will be the thickness of a lenticule there because it may be around 50 to 100 microns. And 50 to 100 microns can be very, very thin uh, membrane-like structure inside. So it is important to dissect anteriorly and posteriorly to the, the refractive lenticle which we have made here. If you see this outer circle is the uh, cap margin, the inner circle is the refractive lenticle margin. So first, normally we dissect the anterior part that is separating the cap from the lenticule. Then we go posteriorly to dissect out the uh, lenticule from the posterior stromal surface. So how do we know that we have done a both anterior posterior dissection here? So what do we have described here? First, we dissect the anterior one. Then we go posteriorly and nudge out the lenticule little towards the proximal side, towards the apex. It creates a little bit of frill here. So this is a meniscus sign which we have described here. So once you are anterior, this inner line is below the uh, spatula. When you are posterior to the lenticule, you can see this line is anterior to the spatula. You are rightly in the posterior plane. Therefore, you are going to avoid the cap lenticular adhesion in these cases because you are separated anteriorly first. So this is a two millimeter incision here. If you are doing a larger four millimeter, then you first dissect the anterior towards the left hand side, then dissect posterior to the right hand side. But that will delineate two. Uh, can say spots or two areas of dissection. In that way, you, you are sure that you have not uh, dissected the denticule directly posteriorly first before doing the anterior dissection in these cases. So this meniscus sign normally helps us uh, to create in, this, uh, in our two different method ways and avoid uh, the complication happening. So I've written here, you can do anterior dissection plane first, then do a posterior. The experienced uh, surgeon, they might do directly posterior dissection and peel off the entire uh, lenticule uh, from the anterior addition also. This will decrease the surgical time and sometimes peeling off also avoids the uh, stromal irregularity happening in these cases. So this is a case after smile after one week. But if you see retroillumination, you can see these two lines quite clearly. This is a uh, cap and this is a lenticle edge very clearly even after a few months of surgery also. A little bit of a stromal irregular, you can see in a retroillumination. This normally goes off after a few months of uh, surgery in these cases. Therefore, smile patient also, if you see a day one results, and you see patient after one year, the results are keep improving as time passes in a smile patient also. So this is an anti-segment OCT of same patient after one week. Uh, you can see the... Uh, the flap as in these cases, which is normally I keep around 120 microns. So these are complications which may be seen in your cases, right from suction loss to a cap uh, side cut tear, which is normally much more to begin with in the first 50 cases of yours. As you graduate in the higher uh, experience with a large number of cases, all these uh, complications decrease out, like a side cut extension, or you can tear the uh, uh, cap like this, you can see a, a cap is torn here. But if you are fortunate, this won't be in a pupillary axis. It normally doesn't happen. Normally happens sideways only and decreases your complication, which can be sometime uh, decreasing the outcome. But most complications which are seen are basically a difficulty rather than like calling them complication. The outcome is normally quite uh, better in these cases also. 
the only complication which can cause the apprehension of patient because patient may have to be taken up after a few weeks or few months of surgery that is the uh, suction loss happening or where you have done a, a lenticular cut uh, more than 10% there the chances of a repeat surgery is much more this is a various causes of a suction loss happening in these cases as i said uh, the suction in these cases is uh, just a corneal suction or limbal suction unlike in elastic which is basically beyond the limbus limbus and the pressure generated in elastic is normally 150 to 200 mm mercury but in this particular smile it is hardly 50 to 30 mm mercury therefore patient can fix to a, your reference light throughout the procedure this is a management uh, algorithm for our patient having suction loss. As I said, if patient uh, is less than 10% of lenticular cut, then immediately we can redock and uh, do a surgery in uh, this patient. It is only when the lenticular cut is more than 10% and suction loss happens at that time, then you have to postpone your surgery, abandon your surgery, or shift to a elastic type procedure, flat procedure in these cases. Apart from that, subsequent to a lens, uh, lenticular side cut, that is completion of entire lenticular uh, creation, or during the cap uh, formation or a cap side cut, the procedure can be done on the same sitting in these cases. So this is one complication which is normally seen in a, to, with a beginner, where they have the, you know, they dissect posterior directly first, and this lenticle gets attached to the cap, and subsequently, you're looking for a lenticle beyond the deeper area to this, you don't find them. In that process, sometimes you damage the stoma here. And then you have to, you realize that something has gone wrong. So we have described in such cases, if you do anti-segment OCT, that can give you the exact idea where the lenticule is in this case. You can see here, this particular case, this is one of my first case, the lenticule was attached to the cap here. And I was trying to, look for a lenticle beyond this area and damage the stroma here. So we describe the reverse sensitive technique here. We put the sensitive, nudge out the you know, cap, which lenticle which is attached to cap, and form the meniscus, and subsequently remove the entire lenticle by doing an anterior, uh, anterior uh, dissection in these cases. And subsequently describe the double meniscus uh, cases for an anterior dissection. If I dissect this side, and this side, then we can peel off this lenticule by the forceps. We don't have to dissect out uh, entire lenticle as such in these cases. Incidence of uh, resurgery in a smile is uh, less than four percent. I'm stressing on this because people ask, "How would you do a resurgery in a patient who requires a touch-up subsequently?" But uh, we know that incidence is very less. And now my journey with smile is touching now almost four years. I have yet to do a, a procedure, reach procedure in, in my patients. But this is the algorithm which we, people have described and we have described in our book also. So once you require a patient to be redone, especially a patient has a residual refractive error or they have a regression in your patient, then the important thing is to assess your cap thickness by doing anti-segment OCT. If your cap thickness is normal, that is 110 or so, and patient has contact sports or patient has uh, interface or patient residual bed thickness. So three things we assess. So what is the type of profession patient has? What is the interface like? And how much is the residual bed thickness in these patients? If patient has a little bit of interface haze, but patient has a residual bed thickness, in that scenario, we go for circle pattern. That is making the this particular cap into flap and it acts like a elastic flap only. But if there's no interface haze, then we can do a surface uh, treatment like PRK, which is most commonly done with mitomycin C. If your cap thickness slightly more, like 140, 130, now, now people are described doing a, a thin flap lacing in these cases, which can also be done in these patients. If you have an interface haze, it's better to do a, a as I said, circle pattern in these patients, and uh, that will decrease the complication of haze in these patients. Little bit on uh, outcome-wise, we know that uh, smile and LASIK, uh, they are comparable, but if you look at a higher uh, refractive correction, that is more than six diopters, smile will induce lesser higher order abrasion, and their results are 
outcomes are better than HML in these group of cases. This I talked about, the regeneration now plexus would be definitely much better than a smile patient. This is one of our patients. This is smile patient. You can say pre-op is almost similar in a elastic and a smile. This is at the end of uh, one month. This is at uh, six months. At six months, the smile is almost recovered, but the elastic is hardly, you can see any nerve fiber. In fact, you can see a lot of dendritic pattern, which also signifies there's a, a blunting of a nerve fiber regeneration. And these patients will have more ocular pain more ocular surface uh, problems, drier features. The inflammation will be much more in these patients and would require a steroids or anti-inflammatory agent for a longer period. Dry eye is a major concern for all refractive procedure, mainly for a laser refractive procedure. Let it be PRK, elastic, or a smile. All of them can have dry eye as such. But a smile will have a lesser induction of dry eyes, especially in those patients who are on a contact lens user, chronic, which are quite a number of patients are there, or those patients who have a little bit of a drier feature before we do a laser procedure in these cases, smile may be preferred in these cases. In fact, we are just going to publish our results uh, where we use uh, cyclosporin uh, in one group, and one group we have used uh, chloroquine drops, and third group was a control. And we started in all patients undergoing uh, elastic and smile despite uh, patient not having dry eye. The subsequent ocular surface management recovery was better in those cases where uh, we had used uh, cyclosporin A for, before this surgery in these cases. So there is a definite inflammation and dry eye component is there in a normal patients also after refractive procedure. So if you combine your steroid, which is there for normally for a two weeks to one month in these cases, and continue uh, cyclosporin for another three months, the recovery of uh, ocular surface is better. In fact, the maintenance of ocular surface is better in these patients. So that is what uh, protocol we have changed recently to include cyclosporin in all patients undergoing laser refractive procedures. Last thing which I like to highlight here is the uh, corneal strength wise, the biomechanical stability of our patients. So if you look into a damage which we do with the laser procedure is maximum with elastic cases where we do, uh, damage the anterior stromal area. We have a, a vertical uh, stromal side cut, which is almost three, 270 degrees. Also, we are doing a stromal, horizontal cut in these patients of uh, elastic area, which is definitely less in smile. The best will be PRK. In PRK, we are just tackling the anterior stroma only. We are leaving the large area of cornea intact because we are not cutting any corneal tissue here. So biomechanical strength-wise, uh, PRK is better. That's why now many people have shifted to PRK in a larger degree of refractive error also, because we know how we can titrate the uh, the haze development which may occur in these patients by use of mitomycin C. We have an algorithm for doing at least you know 10 seconds of mitomycin C for every diet or correction. And especially if patients are requires a retreatment of a haze after a PRK. There, you may have to use uh, mitomycin C for a longer period. In fact, in one patient, I've used mitomycin C for at least you know five minutes in a uh, uh, twice application these patients because patients have a recurrent haze coming up in these patients. But despite using a mitomycin C, sometimes haze does come, and these patients would require a long-term either steroids, which is much more than elastic patients, in fact, PRK patient, I do uh, give them a, a light uh, steroid for a longer period, sometimes up to six months also. And that is how the age will decrease in these patients. These are some of the areas where uh, we are still uh, into not up to the 100% of our uh, required correction. One is breast biopia. There, all laser ablative, ablative procedure onto cornea is, is still not that predictable. We talked about uh, various uh, types of uh, procedure on LASIK. Still, uh, we are struggling there. I think future would have to, we have to work much more in a press biopic correction, which may be laser correction on cornea. It may be uh, some sort of uh, device which is put on the cornea in terms of uh, implants, or it can be a fake IOL or a lens exchange surgeries. Hyperopia, again, uh, still questionable, very difficult to predict the outcome in these patients. Many patients we can't do as such. Smile, uh, we know that is going to come up, but the smile lenticule creation, 
and the extraction is totally different uh, in hyperopia than a myopic patients. It is much more difficult and uh, normally we require an experienced hand to handle a hyperopic case. And future would be to visualize the uh, customized treatment for each patient. And that will give you absolutely better correction for your patient. Where I talked about uh, your uh, topo guided treatments or a wavefront guided treatment, that will be much more pronounced in future in terms of a patient's own uh, wavefront uh, correction required for subsequent. I'm not sure how cross linking going to behave in future because cross link cornea behave totally different than normal cornea with any procedure. And the corneal parameters keep changing for many, many years after cross-linking. The refractive corrections may still may not remain uh, stable in these cases after uh, combining cross-linking with the refractive procedure. So that has to be seen in the long run, how these cornea are going to behave right from the ocular surface to the endothelium in these cases. As Pediatric uh, refractive correction is again a debatable issue. Many patients uh, have a high refractive error, anastomotropia, where people talk about pediatric refractive correction. As far as I'm concerned, I, norm, I have not done a, any laser procedure in, of these pediatric patients. There have been very few patients where I've done a fake IELTS, you know, unilateral uh, high myopic patients. And they've done quite well uh, in terms of uh, amblyopia correction assist. Bioptics is another area where we have to really see how effectively we can treat a patient with a high refractive error where a single modality may not work as such. To summarize the, uh, the recent trends in a, a laser refractive procedures, we know that uh, modern procedures have become better by a few things. One is uh, our screening parameters have changed so much, which makes you a much better uh, assessor for your patient coming for a corneal refractive procedures. I'm not sure if they're going to make things difficult for us because you have to look into a various newer devices, new indices, because every new indices will give you a new parameter to think on. But I'm pretty sure very soon we'll have some sort of a artificial intelligence coming in this area also, which will give you a better guidelines to program your patient for refractive procedures. Other area is uh, we look for a biomechanical strength wise. So we ha will have a better tools, better parameters to assess the corneal uh, biomechanical strength wise. It may be assessing the uh, Bowman's membrane. It may be assessing the anterior corneal stroma. It may be assessing the epithelial pattern. And maybe the uh, what we do normally, the pressure uh, induced the change in the cornea. All things will be uh, combined to give a better assessing of a corneal strength not only for a after refractive surgery, as is for any other uh, procedure also, which may be a cross-linking, which is a major concern for us. Or the thing which we have been trying is to look into orthokeratology for our patients. There also the biomechanical uh, parameters play a huge, uh, hugely important role for us. We know that visual acuity wise, all refractive procedures give a good uh, results. Six, six will be there in most patients. But the quality of vision is very important for all these patients after refractive procedures. And not only for a day one or a one month, the quality should be maintained for a, as long as possible. We have just completed our uh, 10 years, 15 years uh, results of uh, refractive procedures. And the results after 10 years is, uh, if you look into all our patients, they are not uh, really, you know, uh, you can't say they, they had a good outcome as such. So we are not sure it's because of uh, all refractive surgery procedure were not uh, like a modern day refractive procedure, but whatever we did at 10 years back also, that was at that time considered to be a, one of the best uh, surgical procedure. But almost 50% uh, of our patients who had undergone laser refractive procedure 10 years back, they're we they all wearing uh, spectacles. So that is one factor that uh, maybe the, the procedure has not lived up to the, its correction, or there has been a anatomical morphological changes happening in the cornea of these patients, because the age will change the entire corneal parameters. You know, we know that astigmatic pattern keeps changing as age progresses. Similarly, corneal thickness and the refractive profile will also change. So combining all these uh, issues, definitely we have patients 
I think refractive enjoyment after laser refractive surgery is uh, around uh, 10 years in our group of patients because we do operate our patient quite young. So that might give 10 to 15 years. But if you operate a patient at around 30 years of age, so most of these patients within next eight years will require a press biopic correction. So that also increases your load of press biopic correction for future. You have a normal physiological patient requiring uh, correction. Then you have these refractive patients who undergone refractive corrections will have only press biopia. And these are patients who require a demand. They require a correction of this uh, refractive also. And that is a challenge we're going to face subsequently. I would like to thank you all. And uh, we had a smile book uh, coming up three years back. This is our new book, which is going to come in a market very soon. This is going to be launched in a DOS meeting very soon. Current consultative in a refractive surgery, uh, a comprehensive guide for all of us. Thank you again and congratulations the entire BHU team, uh, especially the uh, Dr. Sukla is leading as a vice chancellor, the entire, such a big, uh, I think prestigious institution of our country, the BHU. Thank you again for sharing, being with. Thank you so much, sir. We are enlightened and we are very thankful to you. Uh, sorry, no. my, my the screen doesn't uh, didn't work out. I couldn't show any videos. Uh, any, sir, it was a pleasure. We waited yes. and watched. <laughs> <laughs> Thank no. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I request our head of the department, Dr. OPS Maria, to kindly propose a vote of thanks. Sir, I am admiral, sir. Yes, 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 very much, sir. It's my privilege to propose vote of thanks. Our foundation day of RIO. I wish to extend my sincere gratitude and thanks to our chief guest, Honorable Vice Chancellor Brown's University, Professor B.K. Sukla, sir, who was kind to de devote his time to our background on the occasion of our foundation day of our regional university. He has always been blessing us and was guiding source in the establishment of our regional institute of Dr. H.S. Dua, sir, you are basically carrying the torch of our nation worldwide. We are grateful that you have consented and participated in our webinar and enlightened us on Dua's layer from its discovery to acceptance. Dr. Jeevan S. Singh Titial, the chief of Dr. Rati Center, M. Smoothly, is like a guardian to our institution. Sir, we are extremely thankful to you for being a speaker at our webinar on the respective surgery at current I thank Professor M.K. Singh, the Chief of Regional Institute of Technology, and all our faculty members, Professor V.P. Singh, Professor Prashant Bhushan, Dr. Timoria, and Dr. Alok, especially Dr. Deepak Misra, who is helping in organizing this webinar. We thank all the participants who joined the webinar. I also thankful to all the uh, junior, senior resident, junior resident, office, and other staff of the Regional Institute of for helping in organizing this webinar. Lastly, but not the least, I thank Intor Pharma for helping us to organize this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Are, are we offline now? Uh, about to I be, think? sir. <laughs>